All right, this is gonna be on the exam. And again, unless you work for a thoracic surgeon or something like that, you not have to memorize all this, but it is some concepts that are gonna be important. So cardiac output, you can actually measure it in a patient and determine if their heart is working like it should. So they can actually use a catheter, thread up your femoral vein, go all the way up into the heart, and you can actually measure how much blood is leaving the heart every minute. And so cardiac output is a simple, straightforward uh, mathematical formula, milliliters of blood leaving the heart every minute. And so to calculate that, you have to know with every cardiac cycle, every lub-dub, how many mLs of blood happen with that cycle. That's called stroke volume. And then simply how many times your heart beats in a minute, so beats per minute. So because cardiac output is directly proportional to stroke volume and heart rate, we're gonna talk about things that affect cardiac output. So cardiac output is influenced by stroke volume. I'll start at number two. I don't know if the, my PowerPoint slides are gonna be in this order. It's determined by heart rate. It's determined by heart contractility. That's just a really fancy word for how hard does the heart contract, all right? And then something called total peripheral resistance, or just TPR. And then of course, this one up here is gonna be end diastolic volume, Oop, diastolic volume. Okay, so five things. For all of these, one through five, oh, I'm sorry, one through four, there is a direct effect on cardiac output. Five is an inverse effect. Okay, and I'll explain this shortly. All right. So if I ask questions and I ask uh, conduction system, three things that affect cardiac output. I'll say, if stroke volume increases, what happens to cardiac output? If uh, end diastolic volume decreases, what happens to cardiac output? All right. The ones that say direct proportion, if they go up, cardiac output goes up. If they go down, cardiac output goes down. That's a direct relationship, direct proportional relationship. However, the last one, that's inverse. If total peripheral resistance goes up, cardiac output goes down. And likewise, if total peripheral resistance goes down, cardiac output will go up, all right? So when you have that test question, just remember everything except TPR is direct proportional. You can't screw it up, okay? If one goes up, the output goes up. If it goes down, the output goes down. Just remember the last one, it's the arrows go in opposite directions. Okay, so now let me explain what these are. So heart rate, I don't have to explain too much, okay? Heart rate changes with sympathetic or parasympathetic regulation. One makes it go down, one makes it go up. So if heart rate, increases, cardiac output, I'll just abbreviate it, CO, increases. If heart rate goes down, then cardiac output goes down. The heart's not going to work any harder than it has to. All right? It's just going to keep pace what the demands are uh, on the body. All right? So that's simple, and it's part of the equation. All right? Now, and that's all that's on the slide, I think. Yes. Oh yes, quick review. What are some drugs that can increase heart rate or increase the pacemaker's rate of depolarization? Isoproteranol stimulates both beta one and beta two adrenergic receptors, but yes. How about the one that just stimulates the one, the beta one? Makes the heart beat faster, dobutamine, okay? Um, <clears throat> digitalis, well, that actually, doesn't affect heart rate, but correct. That's not right. But yes, the first two. 
Okay, and those drugs will increase cardiac output. Okay, every time I review, review, these are things that, these are drugs that are so common that you should know them going into the nursing program. And then what are some things that can decrease heart rate? Try not to look at your notes if you can remember it. Hint, hint, maybe it might block a receptor. Hmm? What's one that can block just the beta-1 receptor? Atenolol. And then the one that does both beta-1 and beta-2 for pranolol. And then, of course, you can block the ion channels, sodium and calcium channel blockers. All right. Okay. Okay, stroke volume. I don't know if I have any. Yeah, this is real simple. If stroke volume goes up, then cardiac output goes up. And I'll just put ditto, but if stroke volume goes down, cardiac output goes down. These are not big concepts. They're really not. So I'm not gonna make them more than they are. Now, if you're a nurse that's working with a thoracic surgeon, these things in these calculations can get much more complicated, but just as an introduction, I don't have to make it very complicated. Okay, next. This one's conceptual. And I put a little pie chart here because most people assume that most of your blood at any particular time um, is in your arteries. And it's not. Actually, most of your blood at any particular time is actually in your veins. Now, these numbers are not perfect, but there's some in your lungs, some in your arteries, some in your heart itself. Some most of it's in your veins because your veins are elastic they kind of stretch and gravity wants to pull blood down to the veins anyway so venous return to the heart affects this okay how much blood is being returned to the heart through your venous system, basically ending up in your superior and inferior vena cava, that's going to affect diastolic volume. Diastole is when the ventricles are filling. And diastolic volume is the volume of blood in your ventricles during diastole. Okay. If more blood is in the ventricles when they contract, then more blood is going to be ejected out of the heart. All right. And likewise, if less blood is in the ventricles when they contract, less blood is going to be leaving the heart. So that's cardiac output. So if end diastolic volume increases, more blood is being returned to the heart, cardiac output will go up to match that. If end diastolic volume goes down, Cardiac output goes down. Okay, so venous return to the heart is very important. That's why people who are standing around, and especially the key things like that, and they're not moving, they're standing like almost at attention, like soldiers here at a wedding or whatever, standing still for a very long time without moving much. Those people are more prone to passing out because if you're not moving, part of what helps venous return are the one way valves of veins, right? And also muscle contractions squeeze those veins and help venous return. If you're standing absolutely still for a long period of time without hardly pushing a muscle, your, your venous return goes down, your end diastolic volume goes down and your cardiac output goes down and that means less blood gets to the brain and you pass out, all right? Okay, yeah. And I don't know why I had this here. It's just that I guess I want to impress upon you the right side of the heart and left side of the heart handle equal volumes of blood, but it wasn't really necessary here. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Heart contractility. Um, so let me put this here. Equals how hard the heart chambers contract. And really it's what the ventricles are doing that's most important to cardiac output because they're ejecting blood out of the heart. Now, as end diastolic volume increases, knowing that end diastolic volume is how much blood is filling the ventricles during diastole. Um, as end diastolic volume increases, the ventricles stretch more 
and then they contract harder. It's a weird property of muscle. And yeah, when I was in grad school and I was teaching physiology labs, I oh, hated it. We used to, used to have to, um, we used to have anesthetize, well, actually essentially kill frogs, harvest their gastrocnemius muscles, basically their jumping muscles, and then attach their muscles to something and then attach a little weight to them and then stimulate them to contract with acetylcholine solution and sodium solution. And if the muscle was being stretched, when it contracted, it contracted with more force. I don't know why we had to kill a frog for that, but basically when the muscles are stretched, when they contract, they contract harder, okay? And that's the same thing with your heart. If your heart chambers, your ventricles are stretched, when they contract, they'll contract with more force. And so if they're contracting with more force, they're ejecting more blood out the heart and that makes cardiac output go up, all right? So as down here, okay, first of all, this concept, that when the heart is stretched, it will contract stronger. It's the Frank Starling law of the heart. I like to think of it as the Frank Starling, oop, go back, stretching law, okay? And that has to do with this, what I just wrote above it. As more blood fills the ventricles, they stretch. And when they contract, because they were stretched, they're gonna contract harder. All right, so now down here, if end diastolic volume goes up, more blood is filling the ventricles, they're gonna stretch. So you have increased ventricle stretch, you will have increased contractility, which is the fancy word for when they contract, they contract harder. You will have increased cardiac output, all right? And the opposite is also true. So the arrows are now gonna go in the down direction. You'll have decreased stretch. I'll just say stretch. You'll have decreased contractility. And that will decrease cardiac output. So those are the four things, heart rate, stroke volume, and diastolic volume, and then how much, I basically say contractility, how much the heart chambers stretch. Now, the last one, because like I said, I've got three questions on this, is total peripheral resistance. So total peripheral resistance is the resistance of arterial blood in the vessels. Okay, so how do I explain resistance? Um, if you're well hydrated and the water content of your blood, known as plasma, has a high water content, all right, like you drink about a gallon of water a day, right, your plasma is going to be very hydrated, all right. So the resistance of your blood in your arteries is going to be very low because the water content is very high, all right. Let me put it this way I have a big piece of plastic tubing, and to it, I connect a syringe. And in that syringe, I have pure water, okay? It's not pure water, but it's got a lot of water. And if I depress the plunger and push that water through the tube, is there gonna be much resistance? Is that water just gonna be flying out the tube? Yes, it is, because of the high water content. Water, just pure water, doesn't have a lot of things dissolved in it. That would slow it down. Okay, now let's take water, which in water you dissolve, let's say a lot of sugars, a lot of salt, a lot of proteins, the things that you find in your blood. It's thicker now, and I try and press that solution through the tube. The tube is your artery, by the way. Does that fluid have more resistance in that vessel? Yes. So, and, and this can happen when you have more things dissolved in your blood, or the water content of your blood is very low, or you're dehydrated, and your blood's thicker. And that does happen when you're really, really dehydrated to the point where it becomes a medical emergency. Your blood is sludgy. And there's a lot of resistance to moving that blood through the arteries because it's so thick, the water content so low. Someone who is dehydrated to the point of near pretty much death, what happens is your heart has to work so hard against that arterial resistance that it, your heart overworks itself and stops. Okay. So is it a real nursing thing? Yes. But that's how I describe resistance to you. So is that blood thick and viscous or is it got a good water content? 
All right. If total peripheral resistance is low, like high blood water content, so let's say you're retaining water. Okay. If total peripheral resistance is low, then cardiac output goes up because it's easier for the heart to pump that blood. That blood is not very resistant. It's very easy to pump it. it. Doesn't have a lot of dissolved stuff in it. There's plenty of water in it. Likewise, if total peripheral resistance is high, all right, someone's dehydrated and their blood plasma is thicker, all right, that presents a lot of resistance. That's going to make cardiac output go down. It's much harder to pump that blood through blood vessels when there's all this stuff dissolved in it or the water content is low. I think that's the best way to describe that. Yep. So on the next slide, I think I have all, all the arrows going in the right directions. And so I'm telling you how I'm going to ask this question on the exam. It's going to be really straightforward. Do not second guess yourself. Okay, it's, if it looks straightforward, it's because it is, all right? So for heart rate, for stroke line, for end thought line, for stretch or contractility, the arrows go in the same direction. If one of those goes up, cardiac output goes up. If one of those goes down, cardiac output goes down. The only one that stands out is resistance. The more resistance there is, the harder it is to pump that blood. So high resistance means low cardiac output. Low resistance means high cardiac output. It's literally going to be that. Watch which way the arrows are going. And that's it. That's how you answer that question. And there is a really good YouTube video that explains it in a, in a good kind of medical sense. So if you want to watch that, you can. But since we have more to cover, definitely have more to cover. Um, yeah, that's really good. Okay. Definitely need to get through this. So blood pressure is influenced by blood volume. And the thing that controls your blood volume, the best thing that controls your blood volume is your kidneys. They're the number one thing. So I'm gonna talk about three ways that your body regulates blood volume and blood pressure. And a few of them are gonna involve what the kidneys do. The nursing program wants you to know this. They used to have NCLEX questions on some of these things. So the quick fix, since you're writing a lab report on it, if blood pressure drops too low, like in lab, late, and you know, up, the barrier receptors in your arteries detect it, send a signal to the medulla, so the medulla responds by increasing heart rate, vasoconstricting your arteries, and that makes your blood pressure go up. All right? And then the opposite, if blood pressure goes up, sensors detect it, the medulla responds by decreasing heart rate, vasodilating your arteries, and that makes blood pressure drop. You're writing a lab report on that. That's the quick fix. I call it quick because after you stood up, within what, one to two seconds, you took the measurements, the medulla's already done it. It's already changed your heart rate, changed your blood pressure. That's fast, all right? It's a quick fix, happens quickly, but then after 10, 20 seconds, it's done. The heart rate returns to normal. Now there's a slow fix that involves hormones that affect the kidneys and how much water you retain. And it's called the slow fix because it might take longer. It might take 30 minutes to an hour, maybe two hours, okay? And it will last for hours and hours or maybe even days. And so that's called the slow fix. So if it's the baroreceptors in the arteries and the medulla, that's a quick fix. If it's hormones and that affects kidney function, that's a slow fix. So one's gonna be review and I'm actually gonna skip it in you know, interest of time. Um, so there's baroreceptors. I'm going to teach you a new baroreceptor, all right? And then there's something the hypothalamus can do, and then the kidneys themselves can fix blood pressure. So artery baroreceptors, the quick fix. You know this. I'm not going to fill it all out. I feel like you've got it done. We just went over in lab yesterday. You're going to be writing a lab report on it. Okay, if blood pressure is too low, you stood up after lying down. That's the background by the state of one receptor. And then the opposite scenario. I feel like you've got that. So I feel like I can skip that and not feel like I'm doing you a disservice. Okay. Let me teach you the new one. Okay. 
if blood pressure is too high, okay, this happens and it's a hormonal fix. The sensor integrating center and effector is the heart itself can sense if blood pressure is too high. The heart will secrete ANP, which stands for atrial, atriuretic TI hormone. Atrial, okay? It's happening, it's being secreted from the atria itself. Okay, the effect of ANP. ANP will increase water reabsorption. And that simply means water retention at kidneys. Hold on. I'm tired. We'll decrease. <laughs> I'm thinking of ADH. It'll decrease water reabsorption at the kidneys. So what happens is you have increased urine output. You pee out body water. If you pee out body water, you'll have a drop in blood volume. The water content goes down. And if your blood volume goes down, your blood pressure is gonna directly follow. So the heart fixes it. The heart has a baroreceptor for stretch. It senses high blood pressure. It secretes this hormone which goes down to the kidneys and tells your kidneys, get rid of a bunch of body water out of the pee. Okay, so you increase your output, you lose body water, makes your blood volume drop, that makes your blood pressure drop. All right, that might take an hour or something like that, maybe 30 minutes tops, because hormonal effects sometimes happen within 30 minutes. All right, but it's not as quick as the medulla fixing it, but the medulla fix doesn't last very long. This ANP can be in your bloodstream for hours and hours and hours. And so it'll drop your blood pressure for a long fix. All right, so a new baroreceptor, hormone, kind of a pathway, all right? All right, the next fix, and really it's not a fix for blood pressure, and I wanna emphasize that. Oh. I had all that information there. So I guess I can delete that. When I finish and post these um, notes online, I'll get rid of all the stuff I wrote down because it's there. Okay, your blood salt content, your blood osmolarity. They might call it blood osmolality in the nursing program, I don't know. But there is a normal range. And your hypothalamus, your supraoptic nucleus, um, will sense if your blood osmolarity rises too high. Let's say you ate a few slices of pizza or you ate a ream of saltines or something. You just introduced a lot of salt into your body, okay? Your blood osmolarity, your blood salt content, osmolarity, salt content. And there's more salts in your body than just sodium and chloride. There's other salts. But the sensor, integrating center and effector is the hypothalamus supraoptic nucleus, which releases ADH, which I covered it in the endocrine system, anti-diuretic hormone. All right, let's see what I've got on the slide. Okay, I have to write it out. ADH will um, decrease. No, nope. I have things backwards today. I don't know. I need to have some coffee. Increase uh, water retention at the kidneys. Now you're retaining water, okay? You're, you have a decreased urine output. Don't pee out body water. You're retaining it. If you're retaining water, that will increase your urine volume. I'm sorry, blood volume. That might affect your blood pressure, yep. But that was not the goal of ADH. The goal, it will decrease blood osmolarity. So I put an asterisk next to that because the problem was high blood osmolarity and the goal was to decrease it. The effect on blood pressure is just a side effect. 
A, BH won't be secreted if your blood pressure is too high or too low. The stimulus for ABH secretion is blood salt content. So remember that on a complete exam. If I ask you, which of the following will be secreted if your blood osmolarity rises too high? That one's going to be the only one, ADH, not ANP, not renin, which I'll get to, not any other hormone that would affect blood pressure. ADH's sole role is to fix blood osmolarity. The stimulus for its secretion is an increase in blood osmolarity, not a change in blood pressure. Remember that, okay? That's the big thing. Now, speaking of ADH, there's a disorder of ADH um, secretion where you don't secrete enough of it. So diabetes insipidus. And when I think of insipidus, I think of SIP. So here's what's going on. You don't secrete, your hypothalamus don't secrete enough ADH. So without the ADH, now you are not reabsorbing water. You're peeing out more body water. That makes your blood volume and blood pressure go down. But that's, you know, what happens is you are chronically dehydrated because you're, you're not retaining the body water. You're peeing it all out. You're not retaining anything. You're not retaining enough. So I think of sip. I think if you are always sipping on water because you're dehydrated, that's why I like the diagram. Shows them drinking. You'd be very thirsty if you didn't have enough ADH. All right. It's common enough that I included it because you might see it as future nurses. Okay. Now the next one. I know the nursing program wants you to know. I think there's case studies they assign you based on this. And this is kind of a complex pathway, but because I know the nursing program wants it, the kidney, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, okay? This is a long fix, it's a hormonal fix, and it responds when you have low blood pressure entering your kidneys. The kidneys themselves are a sensor, integrating center, and effector, and they will secrete a hormone to make blood pressure come back up, all right? That thing in your kidneys, I don't know if you learned it in anatomy, it's called the juxtaplanarial apparatus. I don't want to say that over and over. I just give it in the acid and ADA. Ultimately, they get them to increase blood pressure. But the pathway is contorted, all right? But it does have relevance to nursing. I know they want you to know it, and it involves a very common drug prescribed for high blood pressure, so I want to explain it. So if blood volume and blood pressure are low, blood's coming into the kidneys themselves, the kidneys have the JGA, which is a sensor, integrating center, and effector. What's gonna happen is the JGA releases renin. All right, so the JGA is right here. Now renin is in the bloodstream. Now it's gonna go away from the kidneys. It's gonna go to the liver, where the liver is gonna convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin one. So this is a precursor. So that's the start of the angiotensin, angiotensin system. Now angiotensin 1 is in the bloodstream. Of all places to go, it goes to the lungs. Let me move this. The lungs have an enzyme called ACE. Angiotensin converting enzyme has cancer. So ACE converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 is in the bloodstream. That goes down to your adrenal gland, your adrenal cortex, and the adrenal cortex makes aldosterone. So we covered that hormone in the endocrine system. It's got an A and an L and an S and a T, which if you rearrange them, spell what? Salt, okay? Aldosterone increases salt reabsorption at the kidneys. All right, so we've got one of these is gonna be salt. I guess the rest of it is salt. Sodium. And then what happens is that once salt is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, that's what happens when you retain some salt now, water is going to follow salt right back into your bloodstream. So when you have increased water retention, that will increase your blood volume and increase your blood pressure. So it started at the kidneys, but it went all the hell all over the place, all over your body, only to end up back at the kidneys again. And it's moving salt back into your bloodstream and moving water back into your bloodstream. But that's a hell of a pathway, right? It is. So we have some pathways. Now, if blood volume and blood pressure are high, obviously we won't have renin release. Let me get you thinking about this. 
So we have long fixes that are hormonal. One of the fixes is blood pressure is too high entry in the heart. The heart will release AMP, and that affects what's happening in the kidneys. If blood pressure is too low, there's going to be a hormonal slow fix. In this case, running it through the atrium goes all the way down here, and then it fixes your blood pressure by doing the dissection of the kidney fluid. Right. And then, of course, there's the quick fix with the medulla. So let me show you the resources that I have. But first of all, ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, okay, in your lungs. It converts angiotensin one to angiotensin two, right? Angiotensin two will lead to aldosterone production, which causes you to retain salt and retain water to fix your blood pressure. I'm not gonna write it down because it's too much, but angiotensin by itself, okay? can cause your arteries to vasoconstrict. It's a powerful vasoconstrictor. If someone has high blood pressure, let's say they've tried sodium and calcium channel blockers, it's not working. Let's say they've tried a channel block, but beta block, it's not working. Oh, well, let's try ACE inhibitors to bring blood pressure down. And if you block ACE in the lungs, you can't get angiotensin 2 production. Without angiotensin 2, you can't get aldosterone and you can't retain salt and water. You're gonna pee that salt out in your urine, the water's gonna follow that salt out in your urine, then you're gonna lose blood volume and you're gonna drop your blood pressure. Has anyone ever heard of ACE inhibitors? They're a very commonly prescribed drug for high blood pressure. So all this pathway, I didn't teach you to show you how much I know about pathways. I don't care about that. What I care about is it's a commonly prescribed drug for high blood pressure. If you understand how the system works, you understand how the drug works, all right? So, and I know the nursing program wants you to know this. So if I look at my, looking at my time here, I have uh, da, da, two questions on treatment for tachycardia, bradycardia, two on the quick versus long fix for low blood pressure, two on the quick fix versus long fix for um, both high and low, all right? So there's four questions total. It's either the medulla and heart rate and arteries, what they're doing, quick fix, or it's the heart and A&P, or it's the kidneys and ren and angiotensin aldosterone. If I ask you a question on osmolarity, it's none of those things. Just remember that one's ADH, okay? I, I feel good to have covered that. Um, I am not gonna ask this on the exam. I'm gonna skip it. Because I do want to get to a question that I am going to ask you, which is, what am I missing here? Uh, da, 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 da. Treatments for secondary hypertension. So I want to get to that. Okay. So if you click from the PowerPoint here, or if you go to the syllabus online, I have the quick fix. You've seen this before. I'm just going to go to the key. But it also shows the long fix. The quick fix with what the medulla is doing is over here. You studied this for chapter one. Now, then it ends with an aldosterone system. All right, now you wanna look over the long fix as well. And then I also have for high blood pressure, the quick fix with the medulla, all right? That quick fix is gonna be now on the right-hand side, but now all oh, the heart itself secretes AMP. That's the long fix. And then the other flow diagram, is going to be for blood osmolarity. And the only stimulus for that is basically if blood osmolarity goes up, we're talking ADH. It doesn't matter if blood pressure was too high or too low. ADH doesn't care. It will only be secreted if your blood salt content is affected, All right? So there are flow diagrams for this, which we can go over in lab, okay? And then I have a PDF where I just kind of write it out. If blood pressure is too low, your medulla will try the quick fix, but then there's the red angiotensin aldosterone system long fix. If blood pressure is too high, the medulla will try and fix it with the quick fix, but also the heart itself will secrete renin, which is a sorry, A and B. I'm tired too. That's the long fix. And then the blood osmolarity, the only time this is gonna um, happen when you have uh, ADH release. It doesn't matter if blood pressure is too low. It doesn't matter if blood pressure is too high. It's not, the answer choice is not gonna be ADH. 
only if I ask you if blood osmolarity is too high, which of the following will fix it? That question is specifically in ADH. So I'm telling you the exam strategy, okay? All right, we're almost there. I'm gonna skip everything until I get to this. Okay, so vocabulary terms, I know you know them, low blood pressure, high blood pressure. The things that can cause high blood pressure are so many things. Um, and I just wanna teach you the vocabulary and then go over some of the causes because I have some questions on treatments for secondary hypertension. But primary hypertension is called idiopathic because the idiot doctors don't know what's causing it. Don't say that ever to the doctor. But it is a term meaning they don't know what's causing it, idiopathic. If they know what's causing it, it's called secondary hypertension. So there it is. Um, you could simply have, um, you simply could be retaining a lot of water. If your blood volume is high, hypervolemia, that will make your blood pressure rise because whatever happens to blood volume, blood pressure follows it directly. So maybe you might have too much EDH secretion. You could have this thing called Kahn syndrome, which did we cover that in the endocrine system? Yeah, we did, we did. You have too much aldosterone. I do have one question on what the effects of aldosterone are on what's happening at your kidneys. What does it do to salt retention? What does it do to water retention? What does it do to blood volume? What does it do to blood pressure? <laughs> But if you have too much aldosterone, you're retaining too much salt. Too much salt is being returned to your bloodstream. That means excess water is being returned to your bloodstream and that makes your blood pressure go up. How about good old stress? Chronic stress means chronic high blood pressure, okay? Um, pheochromocytoma, we covered it in the endocrine system. That is where too much epinephrine is coming from your adrenal medulla. That, remember I said it's like being on full flight, flight mode for seven days a week, 365 days a year, you wouldn't live a year with this, you would die if you could stop it. Now here's something, and I don't know how much I'll be able to get into it, but I'm not asking an exam question. There's only so much time in a summer semester. Atherosclerosis is the narrowing of arteries from cholesterol deposits in those arteries. The PD, the big three, diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. So those cholesterol deposits inside the arteries narrow the arteries so less blood is able to get through. That makes, it's almost like a, it's a artificial vasoconstriction. The arteries being narrowed, not because the artery muscles are contracting, it's because the cholesterol deposits making the artery narrower. And I mean, the blood pressure going through them is higher. You could have kidney disease. And since your kidneys are the number one organ that affects your blood volume and blood pressure, you're going to have blood pressure problems. And then here's another one I know we should see because it's so darn common called preeclampsia. I like it when they call it gestational hypertension. It's the increased blood pressure that happens in some women during their pregnancy. Some women will have moderate gestational hypertension. Some women will have it so bad that they might lose the pregnancy or they may be put on bed rest. Treating of medications is complicated because if that medication crosses the placenta and goes into the baby, it might not be something safe for the baby. Um, sometimes women's hypertension is so bad in pregnancy, they will actually say, okay, we're gonna put you on bed rest until the first viable time that your baby could be born and still survive outside the womb, and then we're gonna induce you. And so you're gonna go into early um, late labor, they're going to physically induce you with Pitocin and start your labor earlier in your pregnancy than if it's not going to be full term, but it should be enough developed that it can be born and not have to be on life support. But yeah, this is damn, this people who have this and have it bad, it is possible for the mother to stroke out from this and both her and the baby are lost. It's, it's a real scary thing, but you will see it. It's very common. Okay. So Hypertension drugs. Let's just, I think I've done this enough, but if someone has high blood pressure, we have now learned there's many different ways to treat it, right? You can give beta blockers to block the adrenergic effect on the heart and that should slow heart rate down, bring blood pressure down. You can block the sodium and calcium channels on the heart pacemaker. And so even if epinephrine bound to its receptor, the ion channels to increase heart rate don't open. Great, okay? You can give things that affect what the kidneys are doing. And that's called the diuretic pill or the water pill, makes them pee out body water. You can also give them an ACE inhibitor so they don't form aldosterone 
so they don't retain salt, they don't retain water, they pee it all out. There's all these different ways of treating high blood pressure. Okay, we still got some time. I'm actually, do I ask questions on Shaw? Let's see, I wanna make sure and cover it. You know, we don't cover it and it is good to know what's, I'll say quickly about shock, but I am gonna skip this slide, okay? Is it interesting? Yes. When someone says, oh my God, they're in shock. All you need to know about shock, it's a whole body-wide drop in blood pressure. That's what it is. That's what shock is by definition. It's a drop in blood pressure. Now, what's causing the drop in blood pressure? There's different types. If it's from, you've lost a bunch of blood because you're bleeding out, that explains your drop in blood pressure you're losing blood. Is it because you've got uh, bacterial toxins in your blood and your blood pressure is dropping? That, that could be it. If you are having an anaphylactic reaction to something like you ate shellfish and you weren't supposed to, your whole body will have dropping blood pressure. And then heart failure can, but just know that shock is simply, you don't have enough blood pressure in your body. Your blood pressure is dropped, all right? But I'm not gonna ask this on the exam. All right. What I would like to go over is some vocabulary associated with heart disease because it's one of the big three. I'm not asking it on the exam. This is not on the exam. There's not a red star, but it is important enough that I want you to know these terms. Atherosclerosis is simply narrowing of an artery due to cholesterol deposits, and that makes it harder for the blood to get through. And when it does squeeze through, it's like putting your thumb on the dark hose that's running. You have an increased pressure. Okay. So there's danger to this. It makes the narrowing of the artery makes it more likely to have high blood pressure in that artery. It's more likely for red blood cells to get stuck and form a clot. The increased blood pressure in those arteries makes it prone for that clot to break free and flow through your bloodstream as an embolism. And then that clot finds an artery that it can't pass through. Let's say that clot is forming in an artery to the brain, which is half the throat. Let's say that clot is forming in an artery that's in your lungs. You've got pulmonary um, embolism, and that's deadly too, very deadly. Um, lots of problems with this. Okay, so formation of a thrombus is a blood clot. It is likely when you have atherosclerosis. If you can form a clot, you can throw it. So a floating clot or thrombus can block an artery, okay? Ischemia is blocked blood flow, okay? So if that is loss of blood flow to the brain, stroke. If it's a loss of blood flow to a part of the um, lung, that's a pulmonary embolism, and yes, it's deadly. Um, if it's a blocked artery to the heart, you can end up having a heart attack or part of that heart can die from lack of blood. That chronic inflammation, how about this? Arteriosclerosis is stiffening, scarring of arteries from chronic inflammation. Why are they being inflamed? Well, if there's cholesterol deposits in your arteries, it's not supposed to be there. Your, your arteries are gonna be responding by becoming inflamed. And if that the cholesterol stays there for years and years, you've got chronic inflammation. Anytime you have chronic inflammation in your body, your body puts down scar tissue. Now you've got arteries which should be elastic being stiff. And what can happen when they stiffen, all these vocabulary terms are connected. An aneurysm is the stretching of an artery because of arteriosclerosis, and it could lead to rupture of that artery. Have you ever heard of an aortic aneurysm? Okay, if the aorta is scarred, it's got arteriosclerosis and blood coming out the left ventricle under great pressure your aorta is seeing blood at the greatest pressure at any point in your body. And if that aorta is stiff, 
and it ruptures. If it happens to you when you're sitting in the hospital bed, they might be able to save you. That's how deadly an aortic aneurysm is. Because think about your aorta ripping open wide. All the stuff is tied to atherosclerosis or heart disease. Now, I have the time. <laughs> I have some YouTube videos for you. So this is talking about um, forming a clot and throwing a clot. All right. And I have to check the volume and it to be louder than I want. Have to sit through the ad. That's a long ad too. Here we go. So they form in the legs. Deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. DVT occurs in over 400,000 Americans vein. 400,000 Americans. Throwing up locations occur when a clock breaks off and travels through the circulation system. When it reaches a blood vessel, it cannot flow through a blockage occurs. This is called an embolism. 90% of the time, it occurs in the lung. A pulmonary embolism is a life-threatening event. I know someone who died of it. Um, didn't know he had problems, but he was driving from Florida to Maine with his family, and it's a long drive, uh, like 10, 12 hours or something like that. I'm sure they might have stopped for a bathroom break, or, but he's sitting still for a long period of time. Unbeknownst to him, he must have formed a clot in his leg, especially when you're not moving for a long period of time. And he got up, started moving around, <sighs> clot through the clot, went into his lungs, pulmonary edematous embolism, he died, like right there on the roadside. All right. Um, so, yeah, they said 400,000 Americans form deep vein thrombosis, and 90% of those clots go to the lungs. All right. So this is where we're going to end it because I can't possibly top this video, but here's a surgical removal of an, of a clot from the pulmonary trunk of a patient. It was on its way to the lungs and you will really appreciate how darn big this clot was. In place, we are on full cardiopulmonary bypass support. The next step is to apply the aortic cross clamp and achieve cardiac arrest. They had to stop the Here, heart to do the surgery. Here, the pulmonary arteriotomy knife and scissors in the pulmonary trunk. glimpse of the thrombus inside the main pulmonary artery. Oh, the artery, okay. As it branches, you can see it was the were used to remove the thrombus. Look at it. This is a very large saddle embolus that originated uh, likely from the patient's femoral and iliac vein. She it's had a up. fracture of the right lower extremities in a cast. It's like this big. Uh, and uh, this was likely sourced from the right leg. You can see the embolus is removed. They're going to flush the it. Full recatheter is used to uh, clear any further clots, which none are found. Then at this point in time, we take the clamp off of the right super, super pulmonary vein cannula. This allows us to perform retrograde pulmonary perfusion. It goes from the pulmonary veins back through the lungs and out the pulmonary artery, as you can see here. Small emboli and air are clear, you can see in this portion of the video. Once we're satisfied that the pulmonary arteries have been cleared with debris and we ventilate as well during this process, once we're satisfied with that, uh, stop the retrograde pulmonary vein perfusion. We'll inspect with the thoracoscope. You can see here the small branches of the pulmonary veins are clear. The main trunk of the pulmonary artery is also clear. Of and that we inspect the thrombus one more time. You can see this is a very well formed thrombus. Yeah. It's soft. Yeah. So um, a lot of vocab is being thrown out there. Basically, if it's in the pulmonary artery, so it passed the pulmonary trunk, it was on its way to the lung. Probably would have actually made it because it was so big, but if it had, it would have been devastating. So they went in there, they cut open that pulmonary artery, they pulled the thrombus out, and then they used a Foley catheter, a catheter with a balloon on it. They threaded it past where they'd seen that clot and they inflated the um, balloon and pulled it back out to clear possibly any other small clots that were in, in the vessel. And then they allowed retrograde perfusion. So they opened up blood flow. So blood flow would go backwards through that and flush any air bubbles or any small fragments that they missed. That's why they let it bleed out like that because air bubbles could form because they just opened up the artery and started moving along with tools and you get it. An air embolism can kill you just as much as a blood clot can. Right? So they're trying to avoid that. So if you ever work for a 
plastic surgeon, you might see some pretty awesome stuff, all right? But that's a form of that entity. Yeah. Okay, so there's stuff after this, but I certainly can't cover it. On Tuesday, when we pick back up, we'll pick back up with this chapter and get to the blood physiology, but there's simply not the time to do it today, all right? And I just wanted to make sure and cover, and I did cover all the stuff that I'd ask you on the exam. All right, so let's take a well-deserved break before our meeting.